Hello there, Year 13. So, in lesson, we compiled the list of the things that you were worried or concerned about following your IPE coming up in May. The list that has been compiled in lesson is on screen for you. And what Mr. Huckle and I have done is put together this knowledge gap PowerPoint covering all of these specific areas of the A level geography course. So there's going to be three separate videos using this PowerPoint. You can see I've sectioned them off on screen as they are really long and there is a lot of information in them. So I'd rather you be able to find the section that's most relevant to you. So without further ado, let's get started. And we're going to look at video one in this section, and that is on the Shefford and Newton case study, geology of coastlines, sand dune succession, tax havens, and the human case studies as a list as well. So the first thing to say about the Shefford and Newton case study is you did this for diverse places in year 12. It is far too big to go through in a format like this. It would take about an hour to do so alone. So instead, Mr. Huckle is giving you a version of the Luton and Shefford case study that my year 12 actually did this year. He's going to share that with you in lesson and he will go through that with you in lesson for an hour or so. So that will be covered in lesson. For the geology of coastlines, the physical paper, there are two basic types of coastlines, a rocky uh, coastline and a sandy plain coastline. So a rocky coastline is, as the term says, rocky. So we're looking at mainly hard rock here or somewhat soft rock. Um, it's about a thousand kilometers of the UK's coastlines and it's mainly the north and west of the UK. And we have the cliffs in Scotland and the lower relief cliffs in Cornwall as examples. It is resistant rock, so they erode very slowly and there's little deposition therefore because they don't erode enough and they are high energy erosion coastlines. Whereas sandy plains are mainly flat or low relief and gently sloping, they contain wetlands and salt marshes, they are low energy environments where erosion is low but deposition is very high. These can be sand, shingle or cobbled and that is most of the UK's south and east coastlines. So, one key thing to remember about the geology of coastlines is that you can have two types mainly in the UK and they are concordant versus now a concordant uh, coastline like on the left here is for example most of the south coast so Dorset and this is where you have one continuous layer of rock which is hard rock in this case limestone protecting the rest of the coastline behind it so for example we have Dorset here we have the coast and we have a limestone rock all the way along the south coast there and behind it there is softer rock and that one layer of hard rock protects the rest of the coastline. Whereas a discordant coastline, for example Holderness on the east coast, has differing bands or layers of rocks. Okay, so those different layers have hard or soft properties. Some are resistant and some are less resistant. We can see here that the clay is soft and the sandstone is hard. The clay is soft and the limestone is hard, and so on. And what you get, therefore, is these softer rocks, which are adjacent to the coastline on the Atlantic. Those softer rocks erode much quicker than the harder rocks, and therefore you end up with a formation of headlands and bays over. So that is the basics on what the geology of coastlines around the UK look like and how different banding of rock can make a coastline different. Now, there is some very important things at A-level to remember when looking at the actual structure of rocks at a coastline and their geology. The rocks can have faults on them. And these are major fractures because of tectonic plates. So they create a fault line, and that is what a fault is. And that is a large earth force involved, and that leads to those rocks being able to be easily eroded. We also have joints. Joints are like cracks or fractures in the rock without the rock having been moved. So these happen in most rocks, and they can be seen in blocks. 
In igneous rock, they can form during magma cooling. In sedimentary rock, they can form during compression and stretching because of rock on top of it overlying it. We also have fissures. These are more open than fractures, so they are quite wide gaping holes in rocks and can be found on most rocks of the Earth's crust. We also have folding, and folding is where the rock ends. Okay, and this is produced by rock layering. So the layers of rock putting pressure on each other on a coastline can form this folding. As you can see on the image on the right hand side, we have anticlines and synclines when we look at folding. Anticlines are the upward ends in a rock, and synclines are the downward ends. And finally, for coastline geology, we need to look at rock types, so the lithology of the bedrock and the coast. And the rate of coastal recession or the rate of coastal retreat is influenced by the bedrock itself. How reactive is the bedrock to chemicals? How resistant is it? Or is it plastic for less resistant or crystalline for more resistant? And has it got cracks, fissures, or fractures we mentioned previously? So, what we've got here is a quick table. And this shows you the four main rock types. So we've got our igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. We've also got our unconsolidated material. So that is like scree in, um, it's also like scree in glacial deposits. So it is sand, deposits of rock. Now igneous types of rock are granite, dolerite, basalt, they erode very slowly because they have interlocking crystals. They are crystalline. They contain few joints or weaknesses as well. Metamorphic rocks like marble, slate, and schist are recrystallized. So they are resistant, but they are less resistant than sedimentary rock. Okay. And then sedimentary rock itself is sandstone, limestone, and clay. And they are formed by compacting materials together. They are the least resistant type of rock structure and they also have moderate erosion rates as well and then finally your unconsolidated material or sediment is basically not yet solid rock it's lots of sand for example put together now that means that this rock can move and they can drift and it's very easily eroded at around 2 to 10 metres per year. So think of a beach when you think of unconsolidated material. Okay, the next thing to look through for the physical section of the human, or the physical geography part of your IPE is sand dune succession. And the geographical term for sand dune succession is the Samosir. And so what we've got here is a diagram on the top of it to show you illustrate what sand dune succession is. So essentially we start with sand dune succession at the beach, at the sea. Right, so we've got the wet beach and the dry beach. Now on that dry beach we will get what's called embryo dunes as you can see on screen. And these form when seaweed or driftwood or litter provides a barrier or a shelter and it traps them. So when the wind drags the sand along it, the sand gets trapped there and it starts to build up. Embryo dunes start to form, and these are the smallest and weakest type of dunes. So they grow things like pioneer plants, so xerophytes, sea couch grass, or lime grass, or sea rocket. Now, embryo dunes are very vulnerable, and with a storm, for example, can be maneuvered or moved. We have then pioneer plants as we go further along, and they start to stabilize the sand, like marram grass. And that marram grass forms rapidly in yellow dunes. If you move back towards those four dunes, that's where you start to see this marram grass. Okay, so in the four dunes, these are, these are more stabilized dunes further back from the sea. They're more sheltered because they're further away. And these are much stronger. So th that marine grass also creates humus. Now humus is good for the soil and that humus then can be used to develop a second dune or a grey dune. 
And that second zone will be even stronger and we will be able to support, for example, shrubs. And those shrubs obviously have deeper roots, so that stabilizes the soil even further. And finally, then, as you move even further back to the rear dune on the image, these are the mature dunes. So these are the strongest dunes. This, reach, this is where we reach the climax in plant community. So we have lots of different types of plants, even trees growing here, further back away from the sea. And this is the strongest type of dune. So essentially, then, the Samus here is just all about the fact that sand builds up and the further away you go from the sea, the bigger the sand dunes become because they are more sheltered, because the trees and plants and shrubs grow more effectively, and that essentially binds the soil together and it creates a stronger. The next thing you uh, asked us to look at was tax havens. Well, quite a bit on tax havens, so I'm going to go through it. At a quick pace, again, you've got all the notes on screen if you need to refer back to it. So a tax haven, remember, is generally an offshore country that offers foreign individuals or businesses little or no tax in a politically and economically static environment. So these are very useful for companies to be able to register their tax in, to be able to pay less tax than the, com than the country they actually Companies that use tax havens include Starbucks, Amazon, and Facebook, but there are many more, and that is not in Between 2009 and 2012, Starbucks reported no profit, paid no income on tax, on sales of around £1.2 billion in the UK. The reason for that is because they registered in an offshore tax haven and were able to divert all of their tax through that. Amazon only paid 11.9 million pounds last year in tax. However, it created 5.3 billion pounds from British internet shoppers. And that means that again, Amazon were able to effectively offset their tax in an offshore tax haven without paying very much of it in the UK. And then Facebook as well paid 4.16 million in UK corporation tax in 2015. And that was a big increase on 2014. It was only £4,327. And the reason for that is because the UK government brought in some new regulations on companies like Facebook to increase the percentage rate of tax they pay and reduce tax loss and tax evasion. So, just a couple of simple things on tax havens. As you can see here, we've got a number of different tax havens listed along the bottom, and this is in the form of bar graph. We have the Cayman Islands, which is a massive tax haven. We have the Bahamas, Switzerland, the Republic of Ireland, Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, Channel Islands, or the Isle of Man, Bermuda, Hong Kong, and Singapore. These are all considered to be tax havens. And what we can essentially see here is that the amount being put through tax havens has increased quite dramatically in most cases, especially the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas. And we can see that there is more billions of US dollars being put through these tax havens. So the financial companies are putting all of their assets through these different things to be able to reduce the amount of tax they actually pay. Now, the primary uses of tax havens are as follows. They are used for those wishing to avoid or evade paying tax. Tax avoidance is illegal, so avoiding paying tax is illegal. But evasion is always illegal. Tax avoidance, whilst legal, the problem with it is that it does take money away from the country that the business is. Tax havens are also used to hide criminal activities. So money laundering and crimes generating cash that need to be laundered, tax havens are used to create that. They're used for people who want to be anon anonymous as well. So you don't have to declare anything within the nation you are operating your business in. And they are used to somewhere uh, cheaper to do business. 
to avoid costly obligations, to avoid um, costly regulations within the UK, for example, register tax on the Cayman Islands, which is a much simpler process and victim than the UK regulatory tax system. Now, moving on to the pros. I am not going to read all of these out. They are all on screen for you. You could go through them yourself if you want to, but I'm going to just going to pick a few simple things to talk about. So first thing is that tax havens actually protect personal financial information. So they are generally quite politically stable and they have good personal finance records. So there's generally a law that avoids foreign tax officials from being able to access the information in tax havens. So actually, the information of the financial person or the business person is safe in a tax haven. The tax haven will share a minimal amount of information with anybody else who requests it. The second thing is that tax havens have very, very few taxes involved. And that's one of the main reasons they exist. They'll only impose what's called a nominal tax, if anything at all. Very, very basic rate of tax. There's no definition on what level of tax they need to have. And it allows businesses and companies to escape their own domestically high taxes. So to escape the very high taxes of, let's say, the UK. The final thing I'm going to talk about is it's easy to incorporate a business into a tax haven. So tax havens are often well used to businesses using them for tax. It takes very little effort to actually register a business in a tax haven. Yes, you do need some effort at the start to be able to get the business registered and verified and to set up the tax policy. But actually, it happens in a very short space of time and it's a very short process compared to UK regulation. So I've talked through there three of the pros of tax havens. There are two others there you can look through yourself. And then on to the cons. What's bad about tax havens? So the first thing is there can be political or economic instability. So where there's a lot of money present, like in the Cayman Islands, there's also a lot of greed present. And that means that sometimes it can be dangerous when you put money into a tax haven because the government becomes unstable and they become very powerful with the money that is invested in their nation. Another um, problem with tax havens is that there may be legal consequences to using them. For example, in 2008, Germany investigated a Liechtenstein banking trust that many citizens were using as a way to avoid local taxes, created from a local leak. And the problem with this is it may involve jail time if you are avoiding taxes within a nation that your business is registered in. The other types of things that we could talk about here is the fact that although we say businesses register in a tax haven to save money and to pay less tax, actually sometimes it costs more to operate in a tax haven than it would do, for example, domestically back in the UK. So sometimes it costs 2.5 times more than domestically registering for tax in the UK. So actually some businesses find that after they register in the tax haven, after a couple of years, particularly small businesses, actually they're paying more money than they would if they just registered domestically in the country. So overall then, there are many positives, but also many negatives to tax havens. And of course, if we're thinking about viewpoints of tax havens and winners and losers, governments are mainly losers when it comes to tax havens, because obviously, businesses register in tax havens, the government is not receiving that equity that corporation. Um, local communities also are losers when it comes to tax havens in some ways, because it reduces the amount of jobs that stays domestically within a nation. Businesses are definitely the winners when it comes to tax havens, in the sense that business, especially big business like Facebook, Amazon, pay a lot of tax and can actually pay a lot less tax by registering through. And then finally, Mr. Huckle has just put together for you a list as a summary 
of the case study examples and general things that you can use in your exam questions as a list here. So I'm not going to read through the entire list, but I'm going to pick out the big ones that we've spent a lot of time on in lessons. So for diverse places on screen, the biggest one obviously is the local place and contrasting place of so the Shefford versus Luton case study, but we also have many others there. So for population structure across the UK, we have the Tower Hamlets versus Evan case study. For media, we used Jaywood, Shefford and Luton. For globalisation, we used London versus New York and how diverse those places are in terms of globalisation. And then we had a number of different smaller case studies like Cornwall as a rural area perception case study. We had the migration case studies. We also had the London Docklands as a place of change or community evolution. And we also had the management of places, the Slough and Cornwall. Next list that Mr. Hopeless has put together is for globalisation. And as you can see there, there's a number of key things within globalisation. You need to know your international organisations like the IMF, the WTO and the World Bank. You need to know an example of a few trade blocks like NAFTA or the European Union. You also need to be acutely aware of the environmental tensions that could be caused by globalisation. So your example for that was the Mekong Delta dispute or the First Nations project in Canada. And then finally, onto superpowers on this slide. Particular ones of interest there are the BRIC countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and the UN Security Council. And the UN Security Council does make good links to what you've been doing in migration identity and sovereignty as well. China is a major case study in this topic, as well as the USA, and the importance of China is very specific to this topic. Finally, for migration identity and sovereignty, as you know, Mr. Huckle and I taught, both of, both of us taught you this. So there are a lot of different examples in this um, part of the course. Of course, you can use interlinking examples from the rest of the course too, but there's a list here of specific ones we did. So we're looking at the Schengen Agreement, for international migration, within the EU, uh, perceptions on migration in the USA and Mexican migrants. We've got border conflicts there like Kashmir, Rwanda, Syria and Iraq, new nation states in Africa, nationalism in the British Empire. A big part of this topic, of course, was IGOs, international intergovernmental organizations. So we've got Jamaica, Democratic Republic of Congo, Iran, Russia and Syria as UN sanctions. You've also got IGOs in the environment, which is in your IPE. So they are the Montreal Protocol, Paris Agreement, the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, the Antarctic Treaty. And finally, you've got disunity within nations or nationalist movements. That was Catalonia and Spain. So there is a whole list there for you to tick off as you go through and read, but look back over these case studies. But you will not need all of them in your exam paper. These are all of the ones we studied that could be useful to you in your exam. So that was video one of going through these knowledge gaps that you have. When you have finished this one, as you can see on video two, we're going to go through the codes case studies briefly and also experience ranking calculation. So go and head over to that video next.